Welcome back. So today we're talking about one of the new premiums from the update. One that I personally rather like. This is the 3rd Assault Amphibious Battalion of the 5th Marine Division. Per their description, the battalion was formed September 16, 1942, in San Diego. In early 43, it was transferred to New Zealand to prepare for operations on the Pacific Front. From 43 to 45, they took part in battles for the islands of Bougainville, Guam, and Iwo Jima. And in 1945, it was redeployed to the Hawaiian Islands. So, what is the main highlight of this squad? What makes them special? They come with the LVT-4 which is an APC. This is the first and only premium APC squad for America, and if you've seen any of my other APC reviews, then you know that I consider the APCs to be very high value when it comes to premium squads. And we'll get into why that is in a little bit, but this particular APC has aspects that set it apart from every other APC in the game, whether they're tech tree, premium, or event vehicles. And that makes it extremely interesting, and out of all of the APCs in the game, if you were an individual who collects things for their unique qualities, this is the one that would fit that description. At the end of the day, the German half-track, the Russian half-track, and the Japanese half-track, they're all fairly similar, in that they all get you from point A to point B, they all are armed in some way, some of them are better armed than others, some of them are less mobile than others, but Functionally, they perform effectively the same. The The Japanese one, I suppose, is a little bit interesting in that it's got extra machine guns on it. Um, and actually, to correct my old self, those machine guns are actually usable, but for whatever reason, on the crew list, they're not listed towards the top like all of the other guns are on all the other half-tracks. They're, they're listed like down at the bottom of the list. I don't know, it's kind of weird. I don't know why they did it that way, but it is what it is. Um, also, it doesn't seem like you can switch to them particularly easily, but again, I digress. The, the point is, it, it has, or it had at the time, a unique quality in that it had multiple machine guns on it, although that's no longer a unique quality. So, let's get into the LVT itself and what makes it special. Unlike every other APC in the game, it is an amphibious vehicle. If you are a longtime American player, you may recognize the similarities in its appearance to a certain amphibious tank. Also in premium, and from the Pacific, I believe it originally came with Pacific Access, or like the pre-order for Pacific Access. Um, you can still get it though, it's the LBT A1. Uh, effectively, it's it's like a Stuart turret on an LBT chassis, which... Shocker, this is also an LBT chassis. This one, however, is designed to be a troop transport, and so it's open-topped, it gets rid of the superstructure, the turret, whatever, and instead, what you have are two 50 cals that face forward with gun shields, two 30 cals that are on swivel mounts towards the midsection, and an additional 30 cal that is placed right next to the driver in the front of the hull. So this is a very, very well-armed transport. And in-game it shows. If you've used the Soviet half-track, which is an American export half-track, then you know that having a 50 cal, especially at BR2, on one of these can be very potent. Now, you have 
twice the 50 cals on this, and then you also have 30 cal machine guns, and your AI will actually use all of these and shoot at things all around you. It's, it's actually pretty fun driving in, and normally you hear your AIs opening up with whatever light machine gun or submachine gun they're carrying. In this, it it's like it's like a thunder run. Like you just roll through and it's just da 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 da. Just 50 cows and 30 cows going off in every direction. So it's it's pretty cool. The 50 cal itself is actually pretty useful depending on the VR that you're at. At higher VRs, it's a little bit less useful, but it's still better than a smaller machine gun. Um, it, it puts down infantry relatively well. If you're in the Pacific, it goes through buildings pretty well. If you're in Europe, a lot of the buildings are more sturdy, and so it doesn't really go through them. But at low VR, if you get inside of certain vehicles, you can destroy them, which is really nice. So. The LVT itself, its description describes it as the LVT-4, an amphibious tracked armored transporter and fire support vehicle. And it can go at 39.9 kilometers an hour for its max speed, and its armor is 13.666 and 12.0012, uh, being the hull and turret respectively. The reason why the turret's that way, I'm pretty sure they're describing the gun shields on the 50 cals, and so the gun shields basically block in front of you. Technically they have a, a sloped bit that could block something coming down on you, but you have nothing over your head unless you're, I guess, the driver. Or I guess there, there's probably also a machine gunner that sits in there next to the driver, but those are the only two that, that are actually protected. The squad itself is not. It's like it's like just about any other APC, so if a plane comes in and strafes you, people are going to die. And... I guess that's the great equalizer of these APCs. They all more or less perform the same when they get shot at. Like, your crew can survive some surprising hits in every APC, truck, whatever. And... That's to say, you can get shot by a tank and not necessarily explode, people might survive. If a bomb lands somewhere near you, usually, even though it won't always kill the vehicle, usually everybody in the vehicle will die. Same with rockets landing near you. Um, Molotovs absolutely demolish these because everybody inside gets lit on fire. And at the very least, they have to all bail out and put themselves out, because so far there's no way to pat yourself out in a vehicle. At least as far as I can tell. But regardless, the vehicle's usually on fire too, so there's that. Um, explosive packs into the, troop, into the crew compartment will usually blow up the whole vehicle. Explosive packs underneath it will usually take out the vehicle. Explosive packs, if you cook them the right amount of time so that they go off more or less on impact, with the vehicle will usually destroy the vehicle, so, you know, you get the idea. The survivability is about the same as any other APC. The highlight to this is that it is amphibious, which I really like, and that it is more well-armed than other APCs, which I also like. Now, it is a BR2 vehicle, so, just like all of the other ones, you can flex it into BR2, 3, or uh, 5. I mean, you could use it at 4, but 4 and 5 are the same thing. And then it really just comes down to how you equip yourself. For the vehicle itself, the biggest advantage that it has is probably its amphibious qualities. The biggest drawback that it has, though, is its lack of mobility. It, while it performs reasonably well, and if you're driving in a straight line long enough, it can get moving fairly well. Like, 39.9 is not a terrible speed for one of these. The issue that I think it runs into is that it's about a 15 ton vehicle with 250 horsepower, and because of that, <clears throat> it sometimes has issues just picking up and going. So, it can at times be difficult to deal with rough terrain, 
it it can be very slow at times. It just doesn't feel like it has the torque at times to really deal with some of the terrain. But as long as you can get it moving, it's reasonably effective. This is not like like the Universal Carrier, where you're like a little go kart gremlin and you can zip around the place. Um, this is a much heavier. Well, I actually don't know if it's heavier. I'm sure that it is, though, but this this is a much more cumbersome vehicle. So, let's get into the squad itself. The squad composition is the same as every other premium APC, and that's fine. It's a known quantity, and it's probably the best premium squad setup that Darkflow has ever created. So you have some options and what you're getting is a driver which you always have to have and then five other fellows for a total of six of your choice. So you can have up to two assaulters, up to two machine gunners, up to one anti-tank soldier and up to one radio operator. Note that there is no option to take an engineer, and while there are some benefits that an engineer would bring you, like building fortifications or an ammo box, it's not really that impactful, because I feel like the main reason why I bring engineers is to put down spawn points, and everything else, it's like, it's nice quality of life to have, but it's not something that that I find to be mandatory. And because the half-track acts as a mobile spawn point, it offsets the need for an engineer. So the way that I normally run these guys, I run, and this is for basically every nation, it does shift a little bit with America, but this is basically how I run them for every nation. I have the driver, driver's mandatory, you have to have the driver. I usually bring two assaulters, two machine gunners, and an anti-tank soldier, and I usually forgo the radio operator. Now, I'm going to be up front and say that American anti-tank weapons, depending on the BR, are not it. At BR2, they perform perfectly fine. At any BR higher than BR2, they severely underperform. And because of that, you absolutely could make a case to bring the radio operator. However, this is just my opinion, and I think it's perfectly valid to bring the radio operator. I do not bring radio operators for the most part in non-radio squads, and that's because they get a buff in a radio squad that dramatically reduces the amount of time between call-ins. And without that, I don't really feel like they're worth the slot. An anti-tank soldier for America may not always be useful, but they always have the potential to be useful. Whereas a radio operator, because the only thing they bring is an artillery strike, when they're not in a radio squad, they don't have the cooldown bonus, so your artillery's coming in less often. They don't have access to the airstrike, they don't have access to smoke artillery. So, they don't have any of the versatility that they would normally have. And you can only make use of them, like, when you spawn in, and, and then maybe the next time you spawn in, it'll be off cooldown. Because it's like, I think it's like a three or four minute cooldown. If, um, if you bring the AT soldier, if you have the front of enemy tanks, you're probably useless. This is at BR5, mind you. But, if the enemy tank is not sitting in the gray zone, and you have any opportunity to get the side of it, the M9 Bazooka will absolutely destroy anything from the side. But, you know, I'm saying that, and now I'm wondering if you can actually do it to a Tiger 2H. But... Every, everything that I've shot in the side with it recently, I have killed with it. So, you know, take that as you will. As far as the assaulters and the machine gunners, I feel like they're non-negotiable. 
they're part of what gives this squad so much power. Because, effectively, if you look at other premium squads in the game, your closest comparisons to this would, like, with this composition, would either be assault squads or machine gun squads. Now, both of those are five-man squads. They both get one engineer and four insert type. Um, this is effectively a better assault squad or a side grade to a machine gun squad. And why I say that is you bring the same firepower that those do, except you bring one more soldier. You have more versatility because you can choose what you bring, and you bring a vehicle that brings firepower and is a mobile spawn point. If you look at an assault squad, they have an engineer. That engineer can do normal engineer stuff. Other than that, they're just a suboptimal assault squad. If you look at a machine gun squad, usually they bring more firepower than a standard tech tree machine gun squad, because even though they have less soldiers, they have more machine guns. And they can also build heavy machine guns, just like their tech tree counterpart. If you look at these guys, they come with heavy machine guns already on their transport. Their transport is a spawn point, so you've already knocked out everything that you would need an engineer for in a machine gun squad. You have six guys, so you already have more troops and more firepower than an assault squad. Three of those guys can carry submachine guns, two of them can carry light machine guns. So now you've basically split a premium assault squad and a premium machine gun squad in half and put them together. And then on top of that, you get one more specialist of your choice. So the only type of premium infantry squad that can really compete with a half-track squad are paratroopers. And the only reason why paratroopers can do it is, well, I shouldn't say the only reason. There are a lot of reasons. Paratroopers are cracked. But the, the reasons why paratroopers are good is that within, like, 20 seconds, they can show up anywhere you want on the map, and they have the same kind of weapon diversity and versatility that you'll find in a squad like this, because when they drop in, wherever they drop in, they get a box, and in that box, they can pull out an assault kit, an anti-tank kit, an engineering and mortar team kit, or recon kit with uh, two snipers and a radio operator. So effectively, they have all the same choices as these guys, plus a little bit more, but these guys carry most of what a paratrooper squad can choose to pick up innately in their kit. Like, they get less anti-tank weapons, and they get less machine guns, but they get both of them at the same time. So, all of that is to say that if I was looking at getting a premium squad for America, this would absolutely be in the running. If I was looking at getting a premium squad for any nation, the first two things that I would look at are paratroopers, and, and, and this is strictly infantry. I would look at paratroopers, and I would look at half-tracks. I think they are the best bang for your buck, and actually, pricing-wise, I think the half-tracks are a better value than paratroopers, because even though paratroopers can be extremely potent, they, number one, cost more to pick up, because the German and the American paratroopers are BR-5 and they're priced as BR-5 squads. This is priced as a BR-2 squad, or BR-3 squad, I'm not sure which, but it, it's like 24 bucks, I believe. Uh, or like twenty four ninety nine, something like that. So it, it's nowhere near as much as getting the paratroopers. I think the paratroopers are closer to forty. Um, and then, in addition to that, Russian paratroopers are unique in that they can swap their primaries. American and German paratroopers, they can't do that. So as a new player who wants to pick up a premium squad, the LVT is the absolute best bang for your buck that you can get of anything in the premium lineup for this tech tree and and the reason for that besides everything that i mentioned before is that you can take these guys as a brand new player and you can equip them with br2 equipment 
or BR1 equipment, whatever you have available, and you can use them right out the gate from the get-go with your current lineup and you're not compromising yourself, you're not dragging yourself into higher BR, you don't need a whole premium lineup to go with it to support it so that you can actually use it and be, be effective at BR5. You can just bring your BR1 stuff with this vehicle and, and infantry, it's, you know what I mean. And you can be effective. But unlike other squads, like if you picked up uh, the Rising Squad, for example, the Rising Squad is not going to grow with you because they have Risings. It's like a BR-1 submachine gun. It's always going to be, be a BR-1 submachine gun, and you can't change it. But these guys, when you graduate from BR-2 and you want to go and be a BR-3 player, you can throw all BR-3 weapons on here, and it's going to be just as effective. And when you finally unlock BR-4, you can throw all of your BR-4 weapons on here, and it's going to be just as effective. And when you finally cap, and you have everything in the American tech tree, and you're at BR-5, you can still make use of this squad, because you can throw all your BR-5 kit on it, and it's going to be just as competitive, if not more, than all of your BR-5 squads. Now, looking at it by comparison to the truck squad, they come in a Studebaker, which is actually a pretty nice vehicle. Uh, it gets around pretty well, I like it, but most of the trucks uh, get around fairly well. But the key difference between the two, besides the truck isn't amphibious, so if you drive it in water it's going to sink. The, the truck is not armed and it's not armored, so your survivability is probably worse. But if you look at the squad composition between the two, you don't have the same versatility and you don't have the same firepower that you have with the APCs. So for example, the way that mine is set up, I have the driver, who's mandatory, I have an assaulter, I have a medic, a machine gunner, and two riflemen. So it's still a six-man squad. And that is kind of a key distinction. Like I mentioned before, a lot of the older premium squads, whether they're assault squads or machine gun squads, they have less soldiers than than their uh, tech tree counterparts. Not so with the APCs. In addition to that, when we look at this squad, if you didn't want to use the setup that I have, you have three specialist slots. For your first one, you can choose a radio operator, a machine gunner, or an assaulter. For your second one, you can choose an assaulter, a medic, or a sniper. And for your last one, you can choose a machine gunner or an AT soldier. I think taking the assaulter over the medic is a perfectly valid option. I just like having the ability to heal people and put down a box to recover med kits. I just think that it's a really useful thing, even though perk-wise and uh, perk points-wise, they're going to be less effective soldiers, and they also don't have a backpack slot, and they also can't carry a second primary because they have the medic box. So, like, they have drawbacks, don't get me wrong, but I like what they bring to the table. And then... You could bring machine gunners instead of uh, AT and the other specialist. I think, generally speaking, assaulters are usually better than machine gunners, but that can kind of creep in either direction depending on the BR. At BR2, machine gunners are generally worse. At BR5, machine gunners can be very, very potent, so it's really personal preference. <clears throat> the point here, though, is that no matter how you outfit this squad, you're always going to have two riflemen. And as an American, that's fine, because riflemen at BR-5 are basically assaulters. But at BR-2, that may or may not be more of a concern for you. The thing is, though, you're always going to have those two riflemen. <coughs> if you look at the premium squad, you don't have a need to take riflemen. Because all of your slots are going to be filled with non-rifleman specialists. And I feel like that's an advantage. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with riflemen, and I think that they can bring a lot of power to the table depending on how you choose to employ them. But for me, being a player who likes to get up in your face, and I like to play aggressively, and I prefer my soldiers to assault, 
in in my conditions, I think that having effectively three assaulters and two machine gunners is more valuable than having uh, two, three-ish assaulters and one machine gunner. But I actually often run both. So, <clears throat> let's talk the tactics a little bit. I think that compared to other transports, probably the biggest disadvantage of the LVT is that it can be very difficult to hide it. A lot of the other half-tracks and a lot of the other trucks are so similar to map ornaments that are just sitting around that you can park them in plain sight and unless somebody watches your, a squad spawn on it, a lot of the time people won't recognize that they're not just part of the map, and so they'll leave them alone. I park my truck all the time, just off to the side of a road, and it gets ignored all the time. And uh, one of the guys I play with, Stubbs, is always poking fun at me, and he's like, Look, Drew, they're not killing your truck again. <laughs> they just think it's part of the map. And that's not really something that you can do with the LVT. They don't really have anything that looks like the LVT on most of the maps, and a little bit, I guess, if you're in the Pacific, but it's it's limited to, like, the beaches. And if you're anywhere else, like, if you're in Europe, or if you're in uh, the Ardennes, <laughs> you look so out of place. It, it kind of makes sense on D-Day, but... Again, like, it's not something you can just leave in the open, and it's actually a pretty big vehicle, so it's not... Like, it's not impossible to hide it. You can just park it behind a building. But it's not as easy to hide as some of the other vehicles. That being said, because it's amphibious, what you can do with it is park it out in the water. And if people throw explosive packs at it, number one, they need to get close enough to do that. If you park it far enough into the water, you can put it in a position where it's very hard to throw an explosive pack at it, because if it misses and it lands in the water, it sinks. And if um, if you put it at the right distance, you can make it really hard to actually reach it with an explosive pack. And yes, that means your, your troops that spawn in you are going to have to swim for like 5-10 seconds. And don't get me wrong, that is a disadvantage. Somebody with like a machine gun position could absolutely take advantage of that. It's not perfect. But it is an option that other vehicles don't have, and situationally, it can be useful. I also included a clip right at the beginning of this where I parked it and I hid it behind a bush. And don't ask me how, but it survived the entire match. I, I, I honestly thought that it was extremely visible, but hey, it survived. And that was a match where the enemy had complete control of the map and we were getting clapped. So, go figure. Anyway, all of that is to say I highly recommend this squad. Um, the way that I would outfit everybody in the squad is with whatever primary you want to give them, depending on the BR. Um, that really is flexible, there's a lot of really good weapons, but I would give everybody a handgun. The Colt New Service is an awesome cheap handgun, I think it's one of the best 500 silver handguns in the game. Um, but all of the American self-loading pistols are very good, so if you don't take the Colt New Service, I would either look at the Browning High Power or the 1911. I wouldn't bother with any of the other revolvers, though. I think the rest of the revolvers are kind of meh. I have large ammo packs on everybody, and I feel like it's kind of obligatory. You can't build an ammo box, so I like having the ammo. I pretty much gave everybody an explosive pack and flask. Um, normally I would give them all mines, but I'm kind of hurting for silver right now, so I haven't. And I gave the AT Soldier an M9 Bazooka, and uh, this is a BR-5 and a T-20 rifle. You could give them an M2 or an M1 Grand at lower BR. I like the USMC Springfield, but the Ross Rifle's also very good, and the M2 Carbine is also very good. Um, I prefer the Piet over any of the other low BR AT weapons, but 
it has more of a learning curve with aiming it than some of the others, so just take that under advisement. But yeah, I like this squad. I highly recommend it. I don't think that you'll be disappointed if you pick it up. I think you can do a lot with it for all of the reasons that I've laid out in this video. If you have it and you enjoy it, let me know. If you have it and you can't stand it, let me know. As per usual, get out there, kick ass, take names, and win your games.